Okay, here we are on Facebook. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we're going to be talking today about, look, don't condemn yourself because God's not condemning you. And we're going to talk about that and uh, talk about why we can say not to condemn ourselves because I'm going to show you what Jesus did uh, <clears throat> to give us a, uh, <clears throat> the right, the freedom, and the, and, and the avenue of having a, uh, being free from guilt and from shame. Uh, and we're going to go to Colossians, and I'm going to go ahead and go, go down and, and get into the Word of God here. Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to start in, uh, in verse uh, uh, 13. Colossians 2 and 13. And this, is, and this is what it says. It says, And you, that me and you, being dead in our trespasses and sins, and the uncircumcision of our flesh, <clears throat> he made us alive together with him, and having forgiven us all of our trespasses. That would be what we have done wrong in our life. <clears throat> this is what this is what the scripture is saying. It's saying that when Jesus died on the cross, he paid a penalty and a price for our sin. And so therefore, everybody's sin has been forgiven. He says he has made us alive together with him and having forgiven us of all of our trespasses. So if you think back in your past and you think, look what I did wrong, you can wipe that out. You can It's wiped out by the blood of Jesus Christ in the eyes of God. And you can wipe it out in your eyes. I, I remember whenever I got saved, I mean, I had a lot of things going on in my life that were bad. I, you know, I broke all the Ten Commandments before I got saved. I'll let you know that. And so <clears throat> when I came to the Lord, you know, I, I was always confessing my sin. Lord, for, forgive me my sin. Forgive me my sin. And I was always sin conscious, thinking about my sin. But then whenever I realized this, when I found out that Jesus Christ eliminated all my past trespasses, all my past sins, I started thinking, well, why, why should I hold them against myself? And then I had, <clears throat> had one guy, he, he came up to me, and I, I told him that I was a born-again Christian. I'm, all my sins are forgiven and washed away. He said, yeah, but I know, I know what, you, what you like. I remember you. And I, got, and I said, well, I said, well, you go, you go back to Jesus, and you talk to him about it. And if he decides to bring up my trespasses from the past out from under his blood, then I'll talk to you about it. Amen. And so, because it's gone. As far as I'm concerned, my trespasses and sins are over with. They're gone. And yeah, will I, will I have times in the future where I'll fall short? Sure. Everybody in this room will. You know, I don't see any halos over nobody's head. Everybody has times that they're going to have uh, in their life that they're going to have struggles. And they may do something wrong. But guess what? He's there to forgive you of that. And that sacrifice he made on the cross was not only for your past sins, but it's for your future sins. Now, let's, let's read a little bit further. Verse 14 says, having wiped out, listen, wiped out, totally gotten rid of, wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And let me, let me go back and explain that. That's all that religious talking, you know, it's like Bible talking. This is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it down to our kind of language. Everything in the past of your life, because of Jesus, was wiped out, gone, washed away, no more there. And not only that, but he dealt with the handwriting of requirements, ordinances that was against us. Like, for instance, remember I said earlier, I have, I have broken all the Ten Commandments. About, uh, well, all those Ten Commandments was the writing and the head and the ordinances that was against me. The, a lot of folks think that they're supposed to be living by the Ten Commandments, and that's not what God said. God said he brought the Ten Commandments so that we could be realizing that we're sinners. Yeah. The Bible says that when the law came in, it woke up sin or it made sin alive. In other words, before the law, there was nothing that said there was that, 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 that you was a sinner. I mean, it was the actual. If you're going to theology, they call that period of time the time of innocence. 
because there was everybody was innocent. Nobody was guilty of anything because they didn't know. But then, you know, whenever Moses came off that Mount Sinai and he brought those Ten Commandments, those Ten Commandments woke up sin in the hearts of people. And the Bible says that sin was revived and it became alive. Well, sin was there all along. It was there all along. But nobody knew about it. So the law was given to us, the Ten Commandments was given to us to wake it up, to show us that we're sinners. And so, you know, if it says, thou shalt not lie, and if you look at somebody, I mean, I could probably, everybody in the room would probably say, have you ever told a lie? And everybody would say, well, yeah, I've told a lie. Well, then what do you call somebody who tells a lie? A you call them a liar. Well, then, that you see, your consciousness goes and says, well, I'm a liar. Well, that consciousness of that sin just woke up inside of you. I'm a liar. I didn't realize I was being a telling lies. I, I became a liar. If you steal anything, you're a thief, right? So everything in, in those laws were there to wake you up to what you really are. Yeah, to call you out. To call you out, man. That's right. But Jesus, what he did was is he wiped away, wiped out all of those laws that was against you on the cross. So let's go on and read a little bit further. It says that was against you, which was contrary to you, and he is taking it out of the way. Out of the way. And this is, you know, here's the thing. Your mind wants to say, no, no, no I, I got to, you know, I'm going to still live by the thou shalt not. Well, listen, if you live by faith in Jesus Christ and you follow him as a disciple, that faith is, and that love that you show toward others will fulfill the law. That's how we live today. We don't live by being do-gooders. We live by faith. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. So whenever I live by faith in God, and I get his word, and that word comes inside of me, the psalmist says, I hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So in other words, the word of God that continually comes into us, what it does is it causes us to be pure. The Bible says in, 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 uh, in Peter, 1 Peter, it says that you're purified by the obeying, your soul is purified by the obeying of the word of God or the truth. And so therefore, when I start to obey that word, when I start to live by faith in that word, then, and I start loving you, you know, I listen, if you really, really, truly love somebody, you're not gonna you're not gonna covet their goods. Right? If you truly love somebody, you're not gonna steal from them. Yeah. If you truly love somebody, you're not gonna lie to them. Right. You know, I'd rather for you to tell me the truth that hurt, yeah. than to tell me a lie and I find out about it later and still get hurt by what the truth was. You get right? hurt, but you get hurt more. Just tell me. The truth. That's what Mama said. Mama said this. Is what Mama said. She said, she says that you know, little kid. Now tell me the truth because if you tell me the truth. You still may get a spanking, but not as much as you. But you, if you tell me a lie, <laughs> you gonna really get a spanking. <laughs> so it's, it's better to tell the truth and take the hurt than to tell a lie and have a double hurt on top of it. And so you know, that's right. You might hurt, but you'll feel better about it. That's right. And so I never lied to my mama. I promise you that I never lied to my mom. And and I, but she taught us not to be liars. <clears throat> have I ever lied? <clears throat> yes, I have. I, you know, somebody says, "Well, how's this dress look on me?" I mean, you're so good. <laughs> that might have been a lie. <laughs> I don't want to hurt your feelings, right? But, anyway. <clears throat> but anyhow, we all have fallen short of that glory. But going back, all that that was against us, all those handwritings of ordinances that was against us, that condemned us and was contrary to us, was wiped away. And listen to how it was wiped away. This is really cool. I like this. Having nailed it to the cross. When Jesus took those nails in the palm of his hands, you can think about it. All the ordinances and all that which condemned you was nailed to the cross with Jesus. Hallelujah. That is so good. That's good news for anybody that wants to hear it. He nailed it to the cross, and then what he did was this. After it was nailed to the cross, verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, 
triumphing over them in it. In other words, the devil, <clears throat> he used to have the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Guess what? Jesus took the keys of death, hell, and the grave away from the devil, and all the power that was given to him by Adam was taken away from the devil, and was Jesus has that power. And guess what he did? He turned and he said, Okay, all you that's coming unto me, that power belongs to you. Amen. It's yours. The devil's defeated in your life. Satan's defeated in your life. He should not be on any level with you at all. He should be way under your feet. He should be trampled upon. He should. You should remind him every once in a while, remind the devil. By the way, I want to remind you, devil, you remember when Jesus bruised your head? You remember when he bruised your head? You remember when he took you captive and took away from you the keys of death, hell, and the grave? You remember when he made a spectacle of you? Stay there. You know, you're not supposed to be afraid of the devil. The devil's supposed to be afraid of you. And when you get that word inside of you and you start ministering that word over your life and over your family's life and over the lives of others, it just destroys the power of the devil in your life. Just destroys it. And, then, and, and, you, and, and here's the thing. Remember, I told you before, faith is activated by words. If you don't say anything, faith isn't working. Listen to what I'm saying. If you don't say anything, faith isn't working. It's so simple. People want to make faith so hard, but it's the simplest way of living because, see, I'm going to change the way I think according to the Word. I'm going to change the way I think, which is going to change the way I talk, and the way I talk is going to be in a faith mode all the time. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. It didn't say they'll use faith every once in a while. It said they'll live by it. So, therefore, whenever somebody all of a sudden somebody says something like, well, let's say that you got a disease that attacked your body. You know, I don't possess any disease, diseases. As far as I'm concerned, they're trying to infiltrate me. They're trying to attack my body they're like an enemy. I come against it like an enemy. And somebody, and I go to the doctor. The doctor says, this is what's going on. And I get out and somebody says, well, how are you doing? And I said, well, the doctor diagnosed this. But I'm going to let you know that I, it's my benefit to be healed. In Psalm 103, it says, my benefit to be healed. And I'm going to recover, and I'm going to recover quickly. And health belongs to me. I'm healed from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, from fingertip to fingertip. And this disease has no place in me. Well, see, I just live by faith. Now, I didn't. You hear what he's saying? Yeah, that's what you got to say, Susan. Where's your mic? Yeah. Can I tell you something? Me and Mike, uh, I can't get it come to you know. Yeah. It show up. And uh, there was this nice couple. He said that, uh, I think he said he was, he had to be in his late 40s. Uh, he had to be in his late 40s and she was 28. Mm. And I said something that God let some people live after COVID. Yeah, he. And here she told me. <laughs> she says, I'm an atheist. Yeah. Well, you know what? It's a good thing that he does let us live after COVID. Amen? No, Amen. Some, Glory some to God. <clears throat> well, you know, here's the thing. People that are atheists are not really truly atheists. They say they don't believe in God, but I guarantee you, you put them in a, in a situation where they need God, well, they're going to call out upon him. You know, you, but, you know people in, in, uh, in the war, I've heard people say, this guy would say he was an atheist, but whenever the bullet started well, going across his head, he cried out to God, "Help me, Lord!" Amen. <laughs> so they're, they're really not a true atheist in the world. They just uh, foolish because they want to. Just foolish. But yes, ma'am. Uh, when we die, do we go anywhere right away, or do we just sleep? Well, listen, if you were to close your eyes right now and you were to pass on, your body give up. See, in a Christian, for a Christian, that. your body is what dies, not you. That's right. When you, if you close your eyes and your body passed away, when you open your eyes back up, you'll be in heaven with Jesus. You don't, you don't, you don't die. The Bible. This one thing Jesus said. He says. He said that that those who believe in me have eternal life, and they will never see death. They will never die. Well, I'll never die. My body will. But my soul and my spirit will never die. Go, I mean, you already actually, in, in, the Bible says the kingdom of heaven is within us. 
and I don't understand it. Your mind can't see it, but here's the thing. Somehow, we're already seated together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Somehow, we're already there. I don't see it. There's a, there's a, there's a, a, another dimension, spiritual dimension that we don't see, but we can experience right here and now. But when we close our eyes in death, I, we don't we don't die. We just open our eyes up and we're we're where we already are in heaven. We're in Christ Jesus already. Can you see that? Um, I don't know if you can or not. But anyhow, so what, what God did in this scripture, what we see is this. Number one, we see that we were dead in our sins and our trespasses, but Jesus made us alive. Did we see that? We were dead in our sin and our trespasses, but Jesus made us alive together with him. And then it says, he has forgiven us of all of our trespasses. Every one of them. That means they've been wiped away. And then the second thing, next thing is, is that he wiped away, done away with, I mean, just, just think about it. All these ordinances and all these laws and all these things that were against you, he fulfilled them. And then not only did he fulfill them, but he had them nailed together with him on the cross to pay for them fully and wiping them away in our life. That is so good. That is like, man, the blessing of God. Just think about that. So then the next thing we see is this. Is we see that the way he did it was nailing it to the cross. And then not only did that, but he wants you to know that the deceiver, the accuser of the brethren, the one who brings condemnation to you, the devil has been defeated and put way under your feet, way below your feet. And that's where he should stay. You know, somebody I hear people say, the devil's just I just been all over me. He's been on my back all week. Well, what's he doing on your back? Get him off of there. Off Put him under your feet. He ain't got no reason to no be on your back. What is wrong with you? And, you know, I, I remember we, when we were younger, we would have testimony time in church. Remember, remember have testimony? And then and half the people, more than half the people would get up and talk about the devil when they talked about Jesus, didn't they? Well, the devil this and the devil that. Well, well, you know, well, you know, well, the devil ain't supposed to be in your life life. You know, you know people get up there and say, well, you say, well, well I want you, well, I, somebody says, I, I want to be able to hear God and hear his voice. But the devil he keeps telling me I'm never going to be able to do it. Well, you can hear the devil's voice, but you can't hear, hear God's, God's voice. voice. I mean, you know, put the devil where you're supposed to be, you know. And start listening to God's voice. And, you know, the devil is defeated. I really want to stress that. He is gone defeated. Uh, and I want to take you to another scripture. In, in Revelation 12, 11. And it says this. They overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their life unto the death. Three things. Three things to overcome the devil. Trusting in the blood and the finished work of Christ. Using your mouth to speak the word of God to the devil. To the, listen, how do you resist the devil? Well, I, when I did that with this sickness, well, sickness and disease has no place in me. I am healed from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. It's my benefit to be healed. That's what it says in Psalm 103. I will recover quickly. I will be I will be healed and back in perfect health. Oh, you know it. I just resisted the devil. I didn't have to say anything to him. I resisted him with the word of God and the word of faith. Blood of the Lamb, word of my testimony, and the love not life to the death. What does that mean? Well, that means this. If you want it your way, you ain't getting God's way. You, you got to have God. I'm not going to love my way. I'm going to love God's way. Because God's way is the way it's going to work for me. Amen. Not anybody else's way. God's way. So I'm going to love that. Now, I'm going to go to a couple more scriptures here. In, in uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10, this is what it says. Genesis 3 and 10. It says, And so he said, I heard the voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. <clears throat> I heard the voice in the garden, and I was afraid because, I, and I hid myself. What? Why would? Why did Adam and Eve hide themselves when God came into the garden? When before He came into the garden, they were there meeting Him to have fellowship with Him. Why did they hide themselves? Because condemnation, judgment. 
and guilt. That's why they did it. They felt guilty of what happened in, in, in verse uh, 3 8. Listen to what it says. It, it says, Then I heard the vo- sound of God, the Lord God, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. He's heard it before, but he runs from it. And he says, I heard it in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord and amongst the trees. And then this is what? And then God called on Adam. What? Adam, where are you? Where are you? Adam, where are you? And, 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 and he, uh, so he, he said, I heard the voice in the garden, and I was afraid. And he said, who, who told you that you were naked? Who told you? What, what, what happened? Innocent. They were innocent with no guilt, no shame, no condemnation, and they were naked all along. <laughs> but then all of a sudden, somebody told them, you're naked and you shouldn't be naked. Yeah. And condemnation <laughs> came in. Why am I sharing this with you? Because somebody is going to tell you something that's going to condemn you. And you should not receive it. You should take, go back to the scripture and say, no, 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 it's been wiped away. All my transgressions have been forgiven. I am totally, 100% released from my past sins and trespasses. And the blood of Jesus Christ has washed them all away. And even, even what was written against me has been wiped out. Been wiped out. I share that with you because your family may condemn you. How many times have I ministered to people that they say their mom or their daddy or there's somebody that just they just called me this or called me that there and and you get me you think well you're being condemned and you know what it's not really them it's the devil behind them that's doing that work you may have a friend that condemns you you may have somebody else I've I've actually gone to churches and the preacher got up and started condemning people you get me you think well. Condemnation come from all different directions. But here's who told you that? Who told you that that sin that you committed was too big for God to forgive? I know that's right. Who told you that? It had to be the devil. Had to, mm-hmm. Even though somebody might be a person might have told you, but it had to be the devil and to do that. You know, I had one person say, you know, they they said, well, I was I did such and such, and the preacher told me that sin could be forgiven. I said, that's a lie. That's a lie from, I mean, I started off right away. That's a lie. That's a lie from the devil because he's forgiven you of all your sin. He said he washed you completely away with all the, uh, from all sin. And, and so don't believe the devil. Don't believe the devil. Don't believe people that speak but with the devil. It says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, it says, If you say that you have no sin, you deceive yourself. We well, all got sin, so don't don't go here and say you're so righteous. When that halo hello comes from heaven and lands on your head, I may start to think different, but I don't believe it. It says, if you say you have no sin, you deceive your own self, and the truth is not in you. The word's not in you. The word's going to tell you that you you're a sinner. But hey, listen, it says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just. To forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, why is he faithful and just? Because of the scripture we read before. He went to the cross, he nailed it to the cross, he wiped it away at the cross, and for him to hold a sin against you would be unjust. For God to hold a sin against you would be unjust because he justified it, he made it just. On the cross, Jesus made it just as if you never sinned. That's what justification means. He justified you. And the Bible says God is the justifier of those who are being justified. That He's the one who makes us right. <clears throat> so if, if, if you get up and you confess your sin, he's going to be faithful to forgive you. Don't worry about it. It's done, babe. It's done. You forgive it. And I want to. I want to bring it down to uh, reality. I never read the Bible anymore unless it's in a relationship mode. 
uh, I, I, when I read the Bible and I read things about God and about Jesus and about I look at God as my Father, my loving, tender, kind-hearted Father. Jesus is my brother and my Lord, my Savior. And I look at Him as a relationship. So if I look at this scripture, if if I were to come up to Mom, and I would say something to Mom. Mama, and I did. And I said it, and all of a sudden it offended her. And I didn't know it offended her, but all of a sudden Lucius comes up and said, "You know what you said to Mama? It made her mad. It made her feel bad." And I said, "I really didn't make her want to make her feel bad." I, and I realized I sinned against Mama. So I go over there and I, I go to Mama alone. I said, "Mama, I want to let you know what I said. I really didn't mean for it to hurt you, and I, I want you to forgive me." That's relationship. That's right. Now, and she can. She's got the choice to forgive me or not. <clears throat> but Jesus, when you go to him to talk to him, he's already made up his mind. It's done. You come talk to me about it, it's done. You come talk to me about it, it's done. It's forgiven. It's washed away. And so, uh, when I, if I do something wrong, which very little, but I do. No. <laughs> when I do something wrong, I go to him. And I sit down. I'll sit down in my lounge chair. And I sit back and say, Lord, i got to talk to you about something. I did, I did this. I, yeah, he knows you've done it. Yeah. It's like he knew where Adam was. He knew oh, what. Right. He even knew what tree he was hiding behind the fig tree, right? So here, here's the thing. He knows what you've done, but I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna talk to him about it. Lord, I'm. Well, oh, that was stupid of me to do that. You know, I'm not gonna get religious. I'm not gonna fold my hands. I'm gonna get on my knees. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna talk to him because I know his faithfulness toward what I'm gonna talk to him about. And I get up there and I say, you know, I did this and it was wrong. And I'm, I pray. I, I, I thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. I know you're faithful and just to forgive me, but I just wanted to talk to you about it. I want to let you know that I recognize that I hurt yeah. you or I did this wrong. The same way it would Ma. I recognize I didn't know it, but I recognize now that I hurt you, and I'm sorry. That's what he's talking about when it says confess your sin. It's not. It, you're not supposed to be. Listen. This is what I did for years. And what most people do is when they go to prayer, the first thing they do is I got to clean up the sin. Okay, Lord, forgive me the sin. Uh, well, if you know and you let me know, forgive me. The... No, no, no. The Bible doesn't say enter His courts and His praises and into in His presence with uh, confession of sin. It said enter into His courts with what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Pray into His presence with praise. Into His courts with thanksgiving. Presence would pray. So I'm going to go in thinking. And if I feel like I've got it, if you, if you want to get rid of the sin consciousness, first thing you want to start praising about it, say, Oh Lord, thank you. you such a faithful God. To forgive me and wash me and clean. I thank you. Wash me and cleanse me from all my sin. You're so good. You're a wonderful Father. I love you. You're so loving and tender hearted toward me. And you meet my needs all the time, Lord. You give me more than enough. You are so good. See, I'm the, no, when that happened, how many of you got any grandkids? Anybody got grandkids? I know that's right. Got any children? You know, when they, when they come up there and they start, you know, mm -hmm. want your attention, you know, and they get back and they start talking to you. And you mean, one thing you want to do is draw them in. You know, it's like, well, you start going in the presence of God and start worshiping Him and praising Him as you go in. Lord, thank you for being with me, Lord. Thank you. You're such a good Father. He's going to draw you in. He's going to draw close to you and you're going to draw close to Him. That's the way he wants you to do it. Because he wants you to take that consciousness of sin and chunk it away. He wants you to get rid of it. And you get rid of it based upon the finished work of Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ that washed your sins away. Get rid of it. Because see, you'll never go forward if you're living in the past. If you never go forward. Yeah, you can't drive backwards. That's right. If you try and drive backwards and with your rear view mirror, you're going to run into something, right? That's true. And here's the thing. If you live in the past with your problems in the past, you're going to create more problems in the future that's related to the problem in the past. So put the one in the past away. Take it and throw it on Jesus and leave it there. Don't pick it up anymore. So, <clears throat> amen. I'm, I'm going to tell you what. I don't know about you guys, but I am preaching myself happy. <laughs> in Psalms 32 verse 5 this is what it says I acknowledge my sin to you I acknowledge it I tell you what's going on my iniquities I have not hidden them I'm not hiding them and the worst thing you can do is think you're hiding something from God just like Adam thought he was hiding himself from God that's so stupid it, said, it says I said I'll confess my transgressions to the Lord and this is what it says and you forgive the iniquity of my sin you forgive it 
that's what you got to look at God as, as one who readily wanting to forgive you of your sin. He's wanting to forgive you of your sin. He paid an awesome price so that you could be forgiven Amen. of sin. And when, 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 you, when, you, when you realize that, then you're going to, you're going to go to Him every time. In, 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 Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, we mentioned this before, but it says, He who covers his sin will not prosper. <clears throat> if, you, if you have sin in your life that you're not letting go of, yeah. that you're not giving it to the Lord, then you're, it's going to stop your ability to prosper. Now, what's prosper? A lot of people, when you say prosper, they think yeah. money. Yeah. It's not money. Yeah. It's peace. Yeah. It's joy. Yeah. It's happiness. Yeah. It's in good relationships yeah. with others. It, is, it does have to do with finances. It does have to do with having more than enough. But it's not just that. When you prosper, you have a good home. You have a good house. You know, all your bills are paid. You know, you know, everything is, and you have more than enough. You have money to bless people with. You know, you're prosperous. Well, if you hide sin in your heart, you won't prosper. That's what it said. I, that, that's the truth, right? That's the truth. If you hide sin, you won't prosper. So why hide it? Why hide it when you know he has, he is so willing to forgive it? Why hide it? So it says, but whoever confesses and forsakes them, they'll have mercy. Whoever confesses them and forsakes them, they'll have mercy. And so why don't we confess it and forsake it? In other words, don't confess your sin and go back and do it again. <laughs> confess your sin and say, Lord, I need you to give me the power over this sin. Show me how to overcome it. You said in your word you won't let any temptation take me to this uh, the that will overcome me, but you will make a way for me to escape it. Show me that way, Lord, to escape this. I have people that are on drugs and people that smoke cigarettes and things like that. And they say, I just don't seem to be able to stop it. And I say, I tell them, I, 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 tell them, I, say, I say, well, what I want you to do is the next time you pick a cigarette up, I want you to do this. When you light it, when you take your first puff off of it, say, Lord, I want to thank you that you delivered me from this. Right. And I pray you'd make me I sick of it. I pray you'd make me sick of it. I pray you'd deliver me from it. And, and he will. Uh, you know, whenever, I, I remember years ago when I smoked, and I came to the Lord, came to the Lord and the Lord, and I'm smoking, I'm a Christian, new Christian, and the Lord is speaking to my heart. I want you to quit smoking because, you know, I, I want you to be a good witness. And, and I got married and I said, okay, Lord, and I took the cigarettes, and I try to quit. And then one day I'm riding down the road and I have a full pack of cigarettes. And I'm praying, the Lord help me with deliver me from this. Open it up, take one cigarette out, and to get there and get upset, I threw the cigarette out the window and threw my pack of cigarettes out the window. I got about a mile down the road and realized I didn't have any more money, and I would turn around and find another yeah. pack of cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't quite delivered. I wasn't quite there yet. But then one day I'm, I'm, I'm we eating, we eating in the Waffle House with some friends and. I go out and the cigarettes are I have about four or five cigarettes in a pack on the sun visor, and 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 then I reach up there and the Lord says, "I'll deliver you if you let me." Mm -hmm. I said, "But Lord, I've been praying you to do it." Hey. He said, "But you had to let me." I know that's right. I said, "Lord, yeah. I'll let you. You deliver me. You take the desire away from me. I'll 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 and you just take it away." Mm -hmm. And I left those cigarettes up there, and about three four weeks later, the tobacco started falling out on my lap, and I looked yeah. up and I thought. The Lord took the desire away. I ain't smoked one cigarette in a while. Right. And I never went back to never, never, never. And so the Lord will deliver you. It, but you got to let him. That's the problem. Most people want to try and quit themselves. Or most people want to try and do it on their own. But they, they didn't give it to the Lord to, for him to let them. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, I enjoyed smoking cigarettes. I'll let y'all know that. I, you don't I like did. It, there. it was it was fun. I, but it, well, there was for me there was nothing better than to have a nice meal and then go sit down somewhere and have a cigarette. That was you know it's satisfying. But you know what? It wasn't. It wasn't. To start off with it wasn't good for my health, and it wasn't good for a witness. And the Lord was talking to me about stopping, and I finally did. But anyway, <laughs> hallelujah. Now you don't like to be around. What, one of the one of the, the last thing I want to share with you about sin and about things like this, whatever whatever uh, Adam and Eve had done what they did, um, they um, this is what happened in Genesis chapter three and verse twelve. It says, God said, I'm gonna read it 
verse before and got to set it up. And he said, he said, who told you that you were naked? Who told you you were naked? And, and, and you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you that you shouldn't eat. And then the, this is what this is what happens when a person sins and they hold on to sin. Every time somebody does this, you know that there's something inside of them that's sinful. There's a sin they're hiding in their heart. And it's always proven out this way. Every time. This is a 100% guarantee that somebody's holding sin in their heart. They blame somebody else. The man said, the woman who gave me, he gave it to me. And she gave it to me of the tree and I ate. The woman did it. That woman did it. And then, then the Lord said to the woman, well, this is what the woman said. That's right. This is what the woman said. She then the woman said, "Well, what is this you've done?" This is what God. And the woman said, "The serpent, that serpent you gave me, he caused me to eat this." For, at blank. If you have somebody blaming somebody else, it's a hundred percent guarantee that there's a sin in their life, and it, you may even know what it is. But then here's the serpent. He gets up there and he and the serpent turns around and says, Well, who am I gonna blame? <laughs> I, ain't got, I ain't got nobody to blame. <laughs> then the Lord said to the serpent, Because you've done this, you're cursed. Okay. And then the serpent says, Man, great day. What did I do? You know. He's been here's what's really crazy about the serpent. He was used by the devil. Now listen to this. Somebody might be condemning you, being used by the devil. And God didn't put the curse on them. The curse come on them because of what they did. No. Not because of what God's doing. They disobeyed. If you are a person who is condemning and confusing somebody else, the same curse will come on you. Right on you. Mm. Oh, I got my, my, you know, I stay as far away from that kind of stuff as I can because I know how fast... How many of you know how fast a weed will grow up? You get better, you can plant yourself a garden and everything looks really nice. And just before the what you plant starts to come up, there's weeds everywhere. I mean, they're all over the place. They come up so fast. Well, that's the way if you accusing, you judging, and you uh, uh, condemning somebody, it'll come up faster than a weed. The curse will come up faster than a weed. And, and people get better and they say, I don't know why this has happened to me. I can tell you exactly why it's happened to you. Right. You need to repent from that. You need to turn away from it. But don't let nobody condemn you. You need to speak out. No, no, I'm, I'm forgiven. I'm washed away. I'm washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. I don't know if y'all like that, but I like it. I love yeah. it. Thank you. you know, we're, <clears throat> we're, I'm excited to know that the Lord is so loving to me to love me and forgive me. How about you? Amen. You know, we, you can always just talk to Him. And I, I really want to encourage you. I, I like the word prayer. You know, we are a praying church. But I like to use the word talk to the Lord. Yeah. Have conversation with the Lord. Because I want to bring it to a personal relationship type thing. I'm not one of those that can... Uh, at our church, we have people that can pray down a house of fire. Well, I'm not one of those that can do that. I, I pray... You know, when I pray, my voice is softer. That's why I got this speaker here. My voice is softer. And and I don't sound as exciting. You know, you, they, they actually had me pray a few years ago. And and they had this one person up there just praying, yeah, in the house of fire, you know. And they give me the mic, and it's like, no. <laughs> you know, my prayer is good prayer, but it just was no excitement. In it. Well, you know, and, but you know I don't. And here's the thing. I like just to talk to the Lord. Yeah. I like to just Pray communicate yes. with Him. Right. Just like I communicate with you. I have people come to me and they they ask me, uh, talk to me and about a problem. And I said, you know, the way you talk to me about that problem, have you talked to God exactly the same way to Him about it? Because He can take care of it. All I can do is hear you. I, and guide you to the one who can take care of your problem. But if you were before you came to me, just talk to him the same way you talk to me about the problem. He'll take care of the problem. Amen. I have people, I got a person in Peru right now, but they want me to buy them a speaker. They're always asking me for, for things, and which I don't mind. <clears throat> but I pray about it, and I have to have a witness inside of me. And so my response 
my response to one time he, he, he was looking for a car and the car was $7,000. And he says, I, it's a really nice car, Pastor, and it's only only $7,000. It was like, I got a lot. Like we have $7,000. Yeah. And, and so I get married and he puts it out. Right. He, he shows me everything that needs to be done to be able to get in the car. Good. And then I respond to him. I said, well, did you, did you do the same thing to our Father God? Did you present him the same way you presented to me? Because if you do, he'll get he'll give it to you. And he wrote back. He says, "I prayed about it." I said, "No, no, I'm not talking about being religious. I'm talking about the same way you did it with me. <clears throat> well, talk to me, showed me the prices, showed me the car. Did you go over there and say, Lord, there's the prices? And look at the car. It's a nice car, Lord. <clears throat> you know, did you do that to him?" He said, "No, I didn't do it." I said, "Go do it." I said, "Go do it." Well, guess what? He did it. And the next thing you know, the Lord starts speaking to my heart about three, four months later, starts speaking to my heart about helping him with the car. And I'm thinking, okay. And he says, call him up. And uh, we do face uh, the FaceTime thing. And call him up and ask him, has, has, how's the car thing going? And um, he says, um, and the Lord gave me a, a, a price. And he said, the Lord said, $1,500. And I'm thinking, okay, fifteen hundred ain't gonna buy a seven thousand dollar car. Him to give him so, <clears throat> so I get somewhere and he and uh, he says, he, I, he said, well, you know, I, I said, he said, well, it's going good. I said, if you, it's, what's the Lord done for you? Well, he's given me so, such such amount of money, it's fifteen hundred dollars short. I said, <laughs> I said, well, go buy it. And he didn't know. I said, go buy it. I'll, I'll have the money down there in, in just in seconds. I'll through Western Union. So less than a minute, he had fifteen hundred dollars. He went out and bought that car. Afternoon, and uh, so so see what happened was is I wasn't his provider. He was looking at me to be his provider, yeah. right. but he went to God, and right. God became his provider, and He just let me be a part of it. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, Father, thank you for this word, and I ask you to bless it, Lord. I pray, Father, that many people will listen to it on Facebook, and Lord, I pray that that this word will be written upon the tables of our heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody on Facebook, love, like, and share this. Somebody else is going to want to see it, just like you did. God bless you. you. See you next time.